So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome uh, our distinguished guests uh, and uh, distinguished faculty, staff and students to today's panel session that is part of our Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, today's panel sessions has the title, How Will Advances in Technology Shape Humankind's Well-Being in the 21st Century? Uh, I'm Eckhart Grohl. I'm the William E. and Florence E. Perry head of the School of Mechanical Engineering uh, and also the Riley Professor of uh, Mechanical Engineering. And it's my uh, distinct pleasure now to introduce the moderator of today's panel session. Um, this is Professor Luciano Castillo. Luciano is the Kenega Professor of Renewable Energy and Power systems in the School of Mechanical Engineering here at Purdue. Uh, Luciano was the inaugural center director of the National Wind Resource Center and the Don K. Clay Cash Distinguished Engineering Chair in Wind Energy at Texas Tech before he came to Purdue. And before Texas Tech, he was a professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in the Mechanical and Aerospace Department. His research area include turbulence, renewable energy, and bioengineering. Uh, he has published uh, more than 100 publications, edited several book chapters and books uh, on renewable energy, uh, as well as co-authored several patents. Uh, some of his awards include uh, Fellows of APS, Fellow of ASME, Associate Fellow of the AIAA, and the Robert T. Knapp Award. Uh, as well as several best paper awards throughout his career. Uh, based on his contributions to wind energy and the developments at the uh, US-Mexico national border, he was elected as a foreign corresponding member to the National Academy of Engineering of Mexico in 2020. Uh, for his contributions and impact on in inclusiveness, he received the 2016 uh, McDonald Mentoring Award from ASME. There are also the Martin Luther King Faculty Award at RPI and was recently appointed in the College of Engineering here at Purdue as a Dean's uh, Fellow uh, for Hispanic Engagement. He has given several keynote, plenary and distinguished lectures on wind energy and diversity. Uh, with that, uh, please help me welcoming Luciano Castillo as a moderator of to uh, today's panel session. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Eka, for your kind introduction. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor to be here today, and most importantly, to be the moderator of such a distinguished panelist that we have this afternoon today. Uh, so the first person that I would like to introduce is Professor Stacy Connerton. She is the professor in the Bryan Land School of Communication at Purdue University. She's also the director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute. Uh, Stacy brings so much different perspective. Uh, basically, she does research in, at the examines, the leadership, and multi-stakeholders organi organizing. And most recently, she looked at that from the context of pol political violence and preventive initiative. Uh, she has been uh, uh, many different projects. One of the things that she has done, she is the recipient in 2017 of the faculty engaged Scholar Award at Purdue, the Purdue 2018 Trailblazer Award. In 2020, she won the Purdue Provost Graduate Mentor Award. Uh, Stacy, she's also the Associate Head and the Director of the Graduate Studies at the School of Communication at Purdue. She's also the Associate Chair of Purdue in Social Sciences Institute Review Board. Uh, one of the important things that Stacy does, I was discussing with her many uh, months ago, about how can we bring education to people in jail. And I realized that she has also done that when she was in New Jersey. So it's a great honor to, to welcome Stacy Connington here. Please let us welcome Stacy as our first uh, guest panelist. Uh, number two, I would like to, to welcome uh, our special uh, guest, uh, Professor Lance Collins from Virginia Tech. He is the inaugural vice president and executive director of Virginia Tech Innovation Campus that is planned in Alexandria, Virginia. She is the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, was, he was elected this year, actually. So many congratulations to Lance. 
Um, then also for many years, for a little bit over 10 years, he was the dean of the School of Engineering at Cornell University. He was the department head there as well. And he, he has played so many important roles uh, in turbulence and combustion. Uh, one of the important things with Lance is that his leadership skill has overshined the visibility at Cornell. One of the important things that I know for sure is that he made a very significant contribution for women in engineering and diversity at, um, at, 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 well, at what he was at Cornell. He, he, he's the recipient of the inaugural Mosaic Medal Distinction from Cornell Mosaic. He's actually the endowed the Edward Boucher Legacy Award uh, from the Boucher Grader Honor Society. So please let us welcome Lance Collins uh, as our distinguished panelist as well. Thank you, Lance, for taking the time to be here today. And number three, uh, I would like us to welcome our, our distinguished colleague, actually the Eugene Susie Godson, distinguished professor of mechanical engineering at Purdue. His name is AJ Malche. And I have a great pleasure and honor to have interact a lot with him. So we're so honored to have him here today. He is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering. Uh, before coming to Purdue, uh, AJ was the distinguished professor and the 21st century endowed chair professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Kansas, Arkansas. He gains an international reputation for advanced manufacturing, bio-inspired designing, multifunctional material surface engineering, and the system integration. I know for a fact that one of the things that AJ does very well, he brings this perspective of social uh, need with engineering. Uh, he, he is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. He has received many awards, including from the American Society of Materials Engineering. And he has published over 200 articles. He has over 60 graduate students and postdoc in his career. And he has over 20 patents. He's also an entrepreneur. So please let us welcome AJ Malche uh, as a third distinguished speaker. Thank you. Um, and, and the last one, but not least, uh, it's such a great honor to, to be able to introduce uh, such a great scholar and good friend, Professor Victor Castaño. Uh, he's a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He is a member of the National Academy of Science of Mexico, the National Academy of Engineering of Mexico, He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine of Mexico as well. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering of Canada. Uh, Victor, as you could see, being in too many academy means that he does a lot of in-depth research in all of those areas. In, 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 as a physicist, he works in areas in medicine. He does a lot of work in nanomaterials. Um, at the UNAM, where he is, that's his home university in the School of Science, uh, he has over 15,000 15, citations. He is one of the most distinguished and highly cited scientists in Latin America. He has published over 750 journal articles. He has over 73 PhD theses that he co-advised in Mexico, in Peru, in all Latin America. He, co -ad ad he advised over 33 master students and not only does he does a lot of in-depth, amazing fundamental research, he's also a very prolific uh, inventor. He holds uh, over 20 patents. He has 31 books. So we're so honored to, to have him here. Victor, welcome to Virtually to Purdue. And I really wanna thank the entire panel to be present. Thank you for your time. And with that, what I would like to do is to welcome the, the everybody to the meeting. And what we're gonna do here are one of the goals of this panel is that one, we really want to inspire uh, the students and the audience to think of big social problems, but most importantly, to understand how we bring social sciences in and engineering to solve big audacious idea. And each of these panelists in one way or the other reflect those big ideas. Uh, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask a uh, few questions to the panelists. We're gonna start uh, with Stacy first. We're gonna start from left to right. And then after we do that, what I would like to do is to welcome actually the audience to be able to formulate their own questions. We want you to be able to interact directly with the panelists. So let's do that, okay? So the first one, we're gonna start with Stacy. Uh, uh, is this following. 
last year we went through a many, many challenging year from climate change issues. We went through a pandemic. We saw a lot of uh, big challenges, but from the perspective of the pandemic, what I would like to know from each of you, what is your major takeaway from this perspective, from this, uh, uh, this year that we've been going through this, but what is your major perspective from this pandemic as you reflect on it? Stacy, can you please uh, start? I'd be happy to, Luciano. And, and first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to join uh, this very prestigious group of people. And muy buenas tardes a nuestros colegas en México y cerca de la frontera. Um, uh, from the perspective of a, a social scientist uh, who has a particular interest in policy, to me, this past year has really made profound inequities in the United States even more pronounced. Uh, those inequities certainly have always been with us, but COVID has magnified them. Um, COVID has affected women, the poor, rural populations, even more. And when I say affected, I'm not only talking about the physical and mental health tolls, although those have been profound, but also the economic costs, the loss of jobs, reduced income, and the events that led to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the events that led to the border crisis are grounded in social, cultural, and economic inequities. Those inequities are sometimes borne out in policy, sometimes created by policy. Um, what that all has signaled to me and what I take away from, from this last year is that we collectively have an opportunity and it's an opportunity to carefully scrutinize existing policies and to work together with policy influencers to develop new policies that begin to address those inequities and the multiple interconnected crises that we are all facing. And here's the thing, when we do that, we must use our scientific sensibilities. We must base policy on good data and for that data to be good, it must be the result of rigorous scientific research design, and it must be inclusive of the most affected populations, women or underrepresented minorities, et cetera. So as social scientists and engineers, let me just close my remarks by saying, we can and we must work together and with people most affected to design solutions to these pressing social issues. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, very good perspective. Okay, Lance, what is your takeaway on this? Uh, can you expand it? Well, first, let me also add my thanks for, for being invited to, to participate. This is an extraordinary panel and I'm gonna do my best to live up to it. Uh, <laughs> Stacey's opening remarks were excellent. And you know, in some ways I feel like it, this, this has been an extraordinarily difficult year and it's brought out the best of us and the worst of us all at the same time. Um, so what do I mean by the best of us? So I think, you know, it's amazing to be in a time in which in a matter of months, uh, the, the biotechnologists of, of, on this planet, uh, some represented in this group, are, were able to, to design a vaccine, go through trials and bring it to the, you know, bring it to society in, in, in an extraordinary amount of time. But, you know, this, this, this is the demonstration of, of technology. I, when I think of when I was a kid, you know, when there was, when something, you know, a, a disaster happened, the first thing you thought of was uh, money, you know, because it was like, well, we need to resources, you know, that was the first thing. Today, we think technology, right? We think, well, you know, what do we have in our incredible tool chest to do something extraordinary? So I'm proud of that. I'm part of technology. So of course, you know, it's the first thing that comes to mind. But as, as Stacy pointed out, it also brought out some of the worst of us, you know, and, and in, some, in some sense. And, you know, in terms of deception and, and, and you know, misuse of data and, and, and you know, exacerbating uh, racial ten tensions uh, beyond belief, et cetera. So, you know, it's amazing that you could, you know, it was like a, it, like the poles uh, of, of a magnet. We saw the best and the worst. And so, you know, I, I'll, I'll end by saying that maybe the most important panelists spoke first. 
uh, because I'm beginning to think that technology can't solve everything on its own. And it's, it, and that really what's, what this is indicating is, is that the time is, uh, it's more and more, it's becoming more and more important that we find ways to bridge society, an under, deep understanding of society. I don't mean engineers trying to pretend that's not, that's not what I mean. I'm talking about people who are deep in understanding society and understanding policy and understanding economics and the like coming together with us who understand the technology. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Thank you. Uh, and then I would like to welcome right now our, our good friend, AJ Manche. AJ? Well, thank you again, Luciano, for inviting for this distinguished panel. And the dialogue that Stacy uh, initiated very well and then last built upon. I would like to actually ask a couple of actually question in the course of the dialogue that everybody's trying to find out what we learned. I would like to ask a question, what we learned from virus. And I learned from virus equity and equality because virus did not only selectively affected some and let others go. It was across the gender, the color, the countries and all the border. Now, this is probably not the best way to put it, but it is true. And you cannot let the facts take out of the side. But at the same time, I saw human only spared some and let others go. So it is a very interesting conundrum that I am at that what we learn from the nature because nature is resilient. I mean, the reason why this is going through mutation is for survival. And so I think one of the very important things that what I call this like an earthquake, it was a health quake. This was a health quake that created a crack and showed the, the divides. And I think if we can learn anything from that, that what we learn from these divides and what are the ways to heal them. And the second point that I would like to make, uh, bring it out is that typically in the traditional ways, when we talk equity, equality, those are the subject typically we go to expert sociologists like Stacy and others. We talk to the economist, those are, would tell their models. But I believe today it is a techno socioeconomic equity and equality. Because if you think about it, that literally at the Maslow pyramid, everything at the bottom is connected to the technology, from food to the healthcare. And I would like to highlight the difference between the vaccine that beautifully Lance pointed out how some of the brilliant minds on the earth had came up with, but distance between the vaccine and vaccination was engineering. And Vaccination took a long time, but the vaccine came fast. And what that tells me is that engineering has a purpose in the society to bring that equity and equality. And what I would like to call as a call for action is that how we turn science into society benefit. And those are some of the lessons that I'm still learning, I would say. Thank you, Neil. Hey, thank you for the great point. It's beautiful. Thank you. And then I would like to welcome uh, Victor Castaño. Hi, Victor. Yes. Beautiful. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this honor uh, on the SERP that to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, panel. I'm eager to learn from all of you and also from the questions. And um, I'm uh, a very fortunate man because uh, I have been able to, to continue my work uh, during this pandemic not only in Mexico and Latin America, but also in the United States and Europe with uh, groups like uh, Lucianos. Uh, and if you ask me what I have learned from uh, this last year is that uh, we have to re-engineer ourselves, our society and our world. Uh, if we think that uh, this is just an accident and uh, that we will be back to normal, uh, I think, we are wrong. We need to think again, what are we doing as a species and what are we going to be organized uh, in terms of uh, the relations between humans? To begin with, this uh, old ceremony of shaking hands 
is quite likely to change. We are not uh, shaking hands. And after one or two years of doing that, everybody's going to forget that. So our uh, human interaction is going to change. So, and it's already changed. I think that the last uh, 100, 120 years can be rightly called the era of uh, science and technology because we have made technology as never before in, uh, in the history of mankind. But now, starting in 2020, uh, I personally believe and remember that I'm a physicist that we need to enter a new era, the era of ethics. We need to formulate a new ethics on how to do science, how to relate to each other, and how to, uh, to take accountability of uh, what the Stacy mentioned, fact. Victor, thank you so much. And, and I think that there was so many great points that each of the panelists brought. And actually I will mention something very interesting. Human race has been exposed to pandemic throughout. We have lived with virus our entire life. And even with all of those challenges, as a black Hispanic man, I'd rather be on this pandemic than any other time in the history of humankind. So I would like to add uh, the panelists, this is not about my opinion, but I, what I would like to do right now is to bring the second question to the panel because I think they were very important perspective. And, 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 and Lance alluded to this issue of technology, but how do you see advances in technology created new opportunities for us, but at the same time, as some of you ex, uh, alluded, exposed inequality gap in our society. So at, at the core is how technology created new opportunities, but then how technology exposed inequality gap. Um, so uh, is that okay if I start with you again, uh, Stacy? Sure, absolutely, Luciano. And, and I will be you know, building off of, of uh, insights that, that Lance and AJ and, and Victor have shared um, as I think about this question. You know, at, at Purdue, at Virginia Tech, at uh, LUNAM, uh, I think we're all committed, we're certainly all committed to technological advancement and um, we do novel, exciting research and we innovate. Um, what we also consider, I think at all three of our institutions and what we must um, continue to consider, I think even more, is that when we design new technologies and tools, we must remember um, to also examine the infrastructure or sometimes the lack of infrastructure that accompanies um, these novel innovations. Um, so for example, as, as Luciano mentioned, I do uh, quite a bit of political violence prevention work in West Africa, in Ghana, Liberia, Nigeria. And some areas in those countries um, do not have the bandwidth needed um, to connect to the internet quickly, right? So the result is that, you know, people living in those rather remote areas cannot keep up with communications as fast as others living in say the capital cities can. Um, and so what happens, they, they fall behind, right? Um, and a gap between haves and have nots is created and with each passing days it by putting them farther and farther behind. And, you know, what I just described in a way is a metaphor for what limited infrastructure can do um, if we don't, um, if we don't act on it, right? It can create division, as AJ mentioned before. We can have all the technology we want, but if we don't have the infrastructure and the accompanying resources and knowledge of how to use it, um, then that technology might become useless and even divisive. And, and guess what? This is not a, merely a West Africa problem. Um, it's not just a global South problem. This is a United States of America problem. You know, for, for example, I recall when, when here at Purdue, we moved from in-person learning to remote learning uh, last March. Some of my Purdue students who lived in rural Indiana had to travel to coffee shops to be able to complete their, their homework assignments, right? Because they didn't have the bandwidth at, at their home. So access infrastructure, these are policy issues, these are equity issues, and these are very much human issues and, and they must be addressed as such. Stacy, uh, in, in the early stage when you were saying that the COVID, the pandemic, ex uh, magnify the abuse for women in many ways, the violence, but also the economic. Can you, can you explain a little bit more on that 
important. Sure, for sure. In in terms of the violence against women, yeah, mm-hmm. there are some some very very startling statistics, and you you may have seen this that there there are increased evidence of violence against women, but also against men, right? In in households, and um, as a result of uh, well, various social and and different sorts of factors, right? Of people being in the home. Um, but but those those statistics are quite startling, and and they're worldwide, right? Uh, very much including here in the United States. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you, Stacy. Okay, Lance. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so what I observe is there's this incredible acceleration of technology. So if we just think about in our lifetimes, you know, in terms of the the, 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 the sort of the pace with which we develop it and de- deploy it, it just continues to accelerate. So it is, as it accelerates, it exposes the inequalities that Stacy was referring to, because suddenly we become dependent on it and then it, the lack of it then becomes, you know, a more serious uh, problem over time. But I would argue there's a kind of good news in that, deployment of today's technology, even as we talk about the billions it's going to cost and, and, and so forth, think about what it would be if we were laying copper wire or, you know, kind of think about generations before and the sort of per capita expense associated with technology actually is going down. And so in, in a sense, there's, you know, like as much as it's a challenge you know, if there is a silver lining with anything, you know, the, the thinking is to me from a technological standpoint, it has, uh, you know, the, a, 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 a cost curve that's, that's favorable. And so it's a matter of commitment. And, you know, so there are laws have to get passed and money has to be spent. And this is around the world. This isn't just within the United States. And so, you know, it's a question of to, to what degree is society committed to making uh, these things available? And, that's a, then we, we stray right into the political issue. I want to raise a separate issue though, and that is the, the unintended consequences of our connectivity. So we, we are you know, sort of massively connected and we, we can see the world you know, on our screens almost, you know, with, it's a, you know, for those of us with access, it's a trivial matter. But we've we've rewired ourselves, and so you know, human beings evolved over thousands of years to communicate the way you know, sort of verbally, and then we've you know, over a matter of a decade, have completely changed the way in which you know we communicate. We all, if we have children, you, you I, I, that's all I need to say. I, <laughs> the way my daughter interacts with her friends is nothing like the way I interact, and so there's. There is a, um, to me, a, a kind of unclear whether that is all positive or, you know, we, or maybe a lot of it is worrisome because um, it's easy to be in an echo chamber and to, to stratify yourself and to only, only communicate with those that, that, that share your views and to never encounter anybody that doesn't share your views and so forth. And the polarization that comes out of that is kind of self-evident, right? I mean, you just look across society and you see it. And so I just state that as, to me, even bigger than the access issue. The access issue is one of commitment society has to make. The, this issue around rewiring of humans and the ways in which we communicate, that I'm less clear on what's the right way forward. You know, I don't, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Lance, in, in that issue, that aspect, right? I mean, you're looking at some of our, my parents, right? My parents or grandparents during the 80s and 90s, all of a sudden we had the advantage, we, we had the access to the technology to get connected, to get plugged in. But what about them? What about that society group that you were saying that their primary way of communication is not a text? Right, so they're, so they're, so they're suffering in a sense maybe of disconnection because they don't know how to, how to handle and manage the manage technology. So that's one, you know, one element of it. And you go all the way to the other extreme in, in terms of youth, that their only mode of communication is through technology. And there's that, there's that sort of broad spectrum across age. And you know, there it's 
it's just, I, I mean, the thing, I, I don't know how, but it's sort of changed us. And, um, and I just feel like technology can't keep going this way with just the, the computer scientists and the engineers all by themselves in a vacuum designing and building it. Um, I just feel like we got to start to integrate the society, the ethical considerations, the, the uh, policy considerations while we're building it and not just do it in isolation. This is an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you, Lan. Thank you. Okay, AJ. Well, it is really difficult to add any point to what Stacey and Lan said. I'm still reflecting on that. So thank you. Very, very incredible point. The, my, the points that I would like to make is the thesis of those is looking outward and looking inward. Because I see this pandemic also as a lens that has given me a bigger and more powerful lens to look at outward and inward. And what I meant by that, the spirit of philanthropy in the United States is incredible, noted many times by many people, many countries. We have been really good in providing philanthropic help in many ways to the outside world. But I believe that today it is a time and calling to look inward. Because if you go in parts of Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Manhattan, you would find out the scenarios that you would find in other parts of the country, South America, Mumbai, India, you can find it in America. So I think it is very important that as an average American, this is the time to look outward, but at the same time look inward for our own citizens. Because this is this false sense of security and understanding that we are the best, we are the great, and we are in many ways, but not necessarily for everybody. And so I have this important way that how we look inward by keeping the outward outlook. It is very important and that is critical because not the technology is accessible to everybody. I believe today the technology is in the ivory towers. And the example starting from Indiana that during early years, the very, I used to open YouTube and that would say 5G network from Verizon by new latest and here I see the survey that 70,000 children have no access to education because of lack of wireless. Now this is happening in the same geography where I am. And that's what I meant by looking outward and looking inward. And that is more, and this is true as well. In the same one month, I was seeing the news that stock market is making the record on every sense. But at the same time, millions are losing jobs. For my scientist, technologist, and entrepreneur mind, it was very difficult to compute that all thing. I was seeing thousands of Americans and the citizens are no more on the earth in the matters of weeks and, and days. And then I was seeing some of the news. Those are disturbing sociopolitical. So it is very difficult to comprehend as a lancet to the average human mind that where we are, and we are really at a point to ask the question, co where are we going? Outward and inward. And the second, I would also like to look at individual as a human. I see a human as a combination of physiological, intellectual, and spiritual, three parts to our life. We are doing with technology everything that physically, physiologically, we are good. Intellectually, uh, that is something that we can debate about. But spiritually, that bring individual a complete holistic inner peace, I think we are going in the opposite direction in bio. There are rates of suicide are going up. The stress level are incredibly high. The attention span are going down. Access to the fundamental human needs are challenging. And what happened in the recent times, the incidences in the country are very transparent that where the inequalities are. So I do not believe as a human, really technology is helping us to advance. We might be helping our physiological needs, but though that, does, that is only the 33% part who we are. 
So I believe that this false sense that technology, more we advance, the better we will be. I think it is a challenge today. And this is individually, we can look outward and inward and really start doing self in or introspection, who we are and where we are going. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay, Victor. Uh, I would like, if you allow me to, to add a historical perspective to what uh, Stacy, Lance, and AJ had uh, very well described. If you look to the history of mankind, you will realize that uh, many of the conflicts that we have had uh, through history as a society is through these conflicts between immigrants and natives. They never respect. You, you have uh, people who live and uh, have a society and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, some other people come and there is violence, very strong violence. Uh, uh, Stacy was uh, describing to us what happens when women want to, to enter a man-dominated, a male-dominated uh, society, and there's violence, of course. And what, in my opinion, where we are witnessing here is another uh, conflict between natives and immigrants, what I will call the digital conflict. People who are natives of uh, the digital era, like our sons, or against people like uh, many of us who have to immigrate from uh, another era to this one. But the, the, the main problem is not only that, but, in, but also that the people who are young and have no citizenship to this digital era. So they are even worse than us because they don't belong to neither era. That's why I did mention before, and I coincide with uh, my uh, panelists, uh, colleagues, that uh, we have a very serious ethical challenge to face uh, after the pandemic. Of course, we need uh, science, we need math, we need material science, we need uh, microbiology and everything. And luckily enough, we have that uh, in uh, many countries in the world. But what we do not have is the mind to cope with this emerging conflict between digital immigrants and digital natives. Victor, this is a beautiful point. And in fact, one of the, the reasons when we started putting this panel was that more than ever, and we know there have been discussions to integrate engineering with social sciences on engine with other fields. And this, what you had said is clearly highlight the importance for us as, as, as engineers to integrate and create maybe even a new field, right? Where social science is actually embedded in the engineering education uh, for, for part of that matter, right? The issue of the aspect. And what I wanted to do is to, I wanna raise one more question. And then what I would like us to do is to open the floor to, to the audience to interact with each of you. And, and to the line of education, how do you see the pandemic change the education system? And more importantly, what unique opportunities do you see in the future? Uh, so let me start with, with Stacy again. I'm so sure, sorry. Sure. I, I yes. That is fine, Luciano, happy to do it. I, so there are you know, clearly obvious ways that we all have seen and experienced um, education changing during the pandemic. You know, certainly the increase in online learning, um, university colleagues, uh, faculty, staff, students uh, working remotely. Um, you know, for some, as, as Lance was, was articulating earlier, that's a positive and, and for some it, it might not be, right? Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of factors I think at, at play there in terms of family dynamics and, um, and other kinds of things. But what, what I hope does not change in, in education and as a result of the, the pandemic is our, our focus on building relationships with each other. And to me, you know, a large part of education is mentoring. 
You know, in my, my limited experience, much of that is done through those everyday in-person spontaneous interactions that we have in the lab or we have when we're collecting data in the field or, or in the hallway, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and I, I think about first generation um, college students like my father where, you know, physical presence in an educational setting um, really helped him and, and others, other first geners with their socialization and to what higher education was all about and you know, kind of learning the ropes of education and, and finding a mentor that can play that instrumental role in someone's life. So as someone who herself has done a little bit of empirical research on virtual remote work with global organizations, there's certainly ways we can build relationships uh, remotely and online and, and we can even do it well. But there's also empirical, to, empirical evidence, I think, to suggest that, that sometimes, for some, um, online work is, is not preferable. And so um, I just hope that in all of this, uh, we don't lose the human relational uh, part of, of education. Thank you, Stacey. Yes, Lance. <laughs> So, so, you know, I, I, it was a little gloomy in my first couple of responses. I feel like in this case, maybe, maybe I can be a little bit more uh, sort of upbeat here. Because um, so, uh, I actually do think that, that what happened a year ago was a kind of sea change. I think that, and it's got to do with education in the, you know, in the sense of the classroom. It's got to do with our work and, you know, sort of the future of work and how we're going to think about work and where we do our work and, and with whom we collaborate and all of that. There's no question technology is a, is a fast, it's like, trans, you know, instant, you know, uh, transportational, you know, all around. It, it opens uh, opportunities. And I think that um, we have only scratched the surface. And, and so, you know, I hear the concerns that Stacy has and, but I actually think in this case, you know, we've learned how to communicate electronically and improved our abilities to do that. We haven't addressed that in, in the context of education. I think that, you know, in some ways, social networking tools applied to education could allow for, you know, a higher degree of collaboration, um, you know, that's sort of online collaboration and so forth than we have. I think Zoom was terrific emergency work, right? It sort of allowed us to, to, cause Zoom is sort of a meeting with one speaker at a time, which is kind of mimicking a classroom if you think of the professor being that person. And so, you know, there's a, you know, you could map a lecture onto Zoom pretty, pretty easily. Uh, what we couldn't uh, is that, that collaborative thing, that sort of more informal thing that students do with each other um, was, you know, that's not, doesn't map as, as well. And so I feel like there, there, need to, there needs to be advancement of, the, of these tools. And I think it will, because I think we, we there was, as I, I believe it was a sea change. We forced all of, you know, higher ed, a good deal of the K through 12 system online. We, we you know, they just, there was no other way to, to meet. Um, and I think that now that we're on the other side of that, now is the time to really think of a sort of dual modality. So there are things we do in residence and the things we do online. I'm designing a campus. The thing doesn't exist behind me, by the way. That's just an image. <laughs> uh, so, so it's a pretty image though, right? Uh, but anyway, I'm to, I'm to design a technology campus. And, and so I'm thinking very much about this constantly in terms of when, and, and I live, I'm in Northern Virginia. So there's some serious traffic around here. So. When do I force people to go through serious traffic to physically locate on, uh, you know, in the building? And when can they just do something online because they don't need to? They don't need to. And and you know, so it's a it's an ex I think it's an exciting. It's adding a dimension we didn't have before. And if we can figure it out and optimize it, I think learners, different kinds of learners, can be accommodated. I think it has a lot of upside. Thank you, Lance. Very good point. Yes, AJ. And then we, what we're going to do, we're going to do very quickly two more, uh, allow AJ and Victor. And then I want to, we would move transition to the audience because I know they're, they're anxious to ask all of your questions. Yes, go ahead, AJ. AJ. Thank you, uh, Luciano. So I'm an experimentalist and I like to look at observations. 
And one of the very striking observations for me was that in 1920, when the Spanish flu pandemic came, the best technology that came to the rescue, and we're putting an emphasis on the word technology, the best technology that came to the rescue of large population was a mask. And 100 years later, with all the advancement in STEM, the best technology that came to the rescue of all, equitably and equally, is a mask. And I think there is something to reflect upon that, that is STEM a solution or STEM is, is something that we are putting too much emphasis on. I think it is worth thinking about that. Also, we are in the age, the second observation, we are in the age that within five years, one can realize a university of the value of $7 billion. And the name of that university is Coursera. Coursera, where people can asynchronously educate themselves from any part of the world, any time, seven days, 24 hours. It is today a company worth $7 billion in the education profession. So the fundamental mindset that education has walls, boundaries, campuses, dorms, classrooms, quizzes is different now. It has completely asynchronous. So we will move from synchronous education to asynchronous very dramatically. And I believe that what is really that has given us is the mindset at least of lifelong education. And I always believe that I'm educating students for jobs that don't exist. And how do I do that? And that is a very, very interesting point of view. So how my best two techniques are basically make them lifelong learner and best provide them the skills how to learn and not what to learn, how to learn. Right. And the last point that I would like to add is that I believe the future of education is how to connect the left brain with the right brain. Because the only left brain, what we work quite a bit with, still mask is the only solution. So I think if we connect the left with the right brain with more technical, logical side to the more creative and artistic and social side, I think we can create a holistic experience for our students more than anything. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Okay, Victor. And then we're gonna start the questions from the public, okay? Yes, go ahead, Victor. Uh, I would like to thank uh, AJ for uh, bringing us back to 1920, 100 years ago, because that allows me to uh, also revise what we have uh, taught our students uh, all over the world in 100 years. We have uh, uh, been able to teach advanced physics, uh, math, engineering, uh, neurobiology, uh, genomics, you name it. But what uh, we need, in my opinion, to do now is to educate everybody, regardless of their career from uh, social sciences to physics in a, in a new concept, a concept that is being around for about uh, 10 years now and that uh, very few people have uh, paid attention to. It's a concept uh, originated in the Nordic, uh, Nordic countries because they are one of the main producers of uh, dairy products in Europe. And they realized in 2007 that uh, we need one health. One health means that uh, if we want uh, uh, healthy humans, we need healthy animals. We, if we need healthy animals, we need healthy environment. If we need healthy environment, we need healthy humans. So focusing on having vaccines or having technology for humans without taking into account the animals and the environment, it is wrong. And I, I just uh, pointed out very, very uh, drastically, 100 years, we have not been able to realize that uh, we are a single planet. And we share the planet with animals. And we, if we don't pay attention to them, they, they mutate and they produce coronavirus and they produce uh, 40 variants that uh, are around already in, in less than, than one year. And uh, it's going to be an endless uh, story. We need to educate ourselves in this concept of One Health. 
Beautiful, Victor, beautiful. Um, and, and at this point, I would really need to thank each panel. Now what I would like to do is to open the floor for questions. I know that uh, Jerry Smith asked me a question. He's a documentary filmmaker actually in Chicago. And he read one of our articles in Scientific American. And now he's going to produce an article on the US-Mexico border for us, with us. So Jerry, can, can you uh, put the camera and then formulate your question briefly and point to the person you would like to ask the question? Uh, absolutely. I have to figure out how to change my uh, picture. Um, I just can't that, seem to figure that out. That, that's OK, but because we're running that's out okay. of time. Yes, 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 yes. So I, I, thank you. Well, let me first state that you said I was going to produce an article, and I'm nowhere near capable of that. I'm hoping to, hoping to produce a, a documentary film about what Luciano is working on. Uh, secondly, I had a question when I first uh, thought of it, and then you guys have all been speaking so much that you made me think of 10 more, but I'm going to go back to that first one. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm a little more optimistic as an, someone outside of your world about a lot of things that you've mentioned. Um, but one is I look for, I, I sort of do the experimental thing like you said, AJ, and I, I, so I look for evidence to support what I feel. And one silver lining is this, what's happened in the recent days with the corporations, um, you know, the baseball, all of that um, you know, politics. And it's so easy to say, well, it's just, it's, it's nothing's changed, it's just politics. But to me, it fits in with sort of a pattern I've been observing firsthand in some cases. Um, with people I know in that world, but also by watching the news. And I see somewhat of a, a shift or at least the possibility of a shift of, of corporations, large corporations being not so afraid to be, uh, uh, maybe not totally political, but socially political. So Stacey, maybe this is something that you would, would, would be able to expound upon, but I'm, I, this is what I feel, and I'm wondering if you support it, that, that maybe we're at a time when you've got, if we encourage certain influencers, the Elon Musks and whoever, but I guess the Coca-Colas and the Patagonias, that maybe they can not only be more active and not, or less com uncomfortable stepping up, but encouraged to work together, because we've seen that too with Merck and Pfizer, you know, we've seen strange things lately. And if we could build on that momentum and say, well, hey, we've got a huge problem here, whichever one you want to point to. What if we collaborate? And what if it's great for us as a company and great for society and et cetera? Do you think maybe we're on that cusp of Because I see it as especially from a big change shift from 100 years ago, by the way, AJ, when you had robber barons. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Jerry, this is such a wonderful question and set of observations and I know our, our fellow panelists will want to jump in on this too, but let me just start by saying that um, one of the courses I'm privileged to teach at Purdue is for first year STEM students. Um, uh, it's called Transformative Texts in the College of Liberal Arts um, Quarterstone Program. And one of the very first uh, books that we read, we don't read the entire thing because it's quite lengthy, but it's Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And one of de, de Tocqueville has many treatises, many, many important points in the book, but one of them relates to what you've just spoken about. And, you know, this is um, a French person, right, uh, reflecting on what it means to be um, a U.S. A uh, citizen, right, uh, several years ago. And one of the things that he reminds us of is the importance of a citizen, and not only the individual citizens, but groups of citizens um, participating actively in their democracy to continue to make the grand experiment of American democracy better. Right. And so when I listen to your question, I think of, you know, what should be, what could be the role of corporate America or corporate global, right, in, in that process, right? What what role could, could corporate, um, I'll just say America in this case, play, you know, because the context that you spoke with. And I, you know, I, I think of to myself, never have I been more proud to be a million miler with Delta, right, than right now, because Delta stood up on two big major social issues, and they've taken a lot of heat. And even, you know, when initially they don't get it right, 
they turn around and admit that they don't get it right, and then they they, they get it right. Um, so I I firmly agree with you that we're seeing some evidence that more and more corporations are stepping up, and we're seeing more and more. I think corporations around the world want to be involved in social justice issues in in real change, right? And um, I'll point out since we have we have uh, wonderful colleagues from Latin America on the call, one of my favorite corporate examples is a company called Crepes and Waffles that's Colombian, right? Uh, Crepes and Waffles is a fantastic um, restaurant, but also wonderfully uh, corporate, wonderfully conscious, socially conscious in the sense that they built their business model around single women who needed jobs to support their families and that's who they hired. Um, so those, those are my observations to your wonderful question. Sure. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, anybody in the, pan the panelists would like to add any further on, on this on this point on this issue? To Jerry's question, I just want to note something. And Jerry, as you are an experimentalist, observe. I believe in the 19th century, the countries were making the policies, and in this century, I learned. What I have seen is that the corporations have become the countries. Because when you have some corporations, those are worth of more than a trillion dollars. You're looking at a country, you're not looking at a corporation. And people work in that corporation, just people work in a country. And especially they have to keep eyes on the next generation, generation Zs and beyond, and social consciousness between the age 20 to age 80. And I think that social consciousness and ability to influence, I think are make, you're starting to see that play in real life. That's the way I see that corporations are today are countries without boundaries. So corporations have no boundaries practically. <laughs> and that makes a transformative shift. Thank you, AJ. Very good. Any, anybody else? Uh... I, I Thank you all, by the way. Y yes. Oh. I just said thank you. I, oh, okay. You're, you're, you're brilliant answers. Thank you. Thank you. And I know we have a uh, uh, William George here. I don't, I'm sure he he will have a question because he always has a question in almost every meeting. Um, Bill, I, I think you you're muted, but I in case you would like to ask a question. Okay, I don't hear him, so I'm assuming he's uh, muted. Anybody else would like to raise a question to the panelists? I have a question. Yes, Luis. Thank so you, Luis. I, I think uh, a lot of the panelists agree that there needs to be kind of a intersection between technology and social sciences. And so my question is, how do you envision this, uh, in this kind of connection between the two sides and how do you think they are synergetic and could kind of add to one another so it's just a general question for the panelists you mind if i jump in on that that's one I'm, i think a lot about and it's because I, I am an engineer um but my entire family are social scientists like I, like I'm this weird, you know, person that that you know, at dinner at dinner conversations, it's social science. It's not Newton's laws. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity, and it's it goes both ways. And I think they're always whenever you talk about collaboration, it's got to, the winning has to happen in both directions. I think that um, you might say, why would a social scientist come work with engineers? Well, you know. Social scientists, historically, when they were trying to get, gather data, they would survey. And it was an arduous thing. And, you know, now we're talking about you can look at a Twitter feed and, and have, you know, sort of uh, multiple orders of magnitude, more insight, information, data, you know. So there is a, so they are becoming interested in, in technology. They're not the technologists, but they certainly bring, you know, that uh, capability. And so there's suddenly this, new kind of uh, field that's the fields that are growing up as a consequence of the access, you know, to, to information that is, you know, pouring out of, you know, all of the, the exhaust, you know, digital exhaust is a term that people often use. On the other side of this, I think, 
that technologists are coming to realize that, that the sort of bringing the deep understanding, and that's what I want to emphasize, real expertise, not, not just that a technologist has learned a little, has done a little reading, but in some ways really looking at scholarship from the two areas coming together is needed in order to really move technology in the right direction. So I really feel like this is a moment in which, you know, kind of everyone can win when they come together. Um, I, I would like to answer uh, very quickly Luis Gomez's uh, uh, question by saying that uh, what we have to do, in my opinion, is to dare to take the first step. And let me share my personal experience. I'm a physicist who have worked uh, for uh, 30 some years in nanotechnology, material science, computer simulations, and I'm teaching this semester a course on ethics of science and technology at the School of Law. So you can imagine uh, the, the face of uh, students of law uh, when a physicist steps into the room. And the second uh, thing that I want to share with you is that uh, I was able to convince a psychologist. Uh, she holds a, a bachelor's and master's degree in psychology, and she is uh, doing a PhD in computer science, going after this uh, gap between digital uh, 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 immigrants and digital natives that I described. So I guess what we have to do is uh, to dare to, to go, not only talk, as, uh, as uh, Lance said, which is uh, the very first step, but also take some action in uh, going uh, and try to see the world the way uh, others do. And uh, that includes uh, social scientists, uh, artists, uh, common people, even politicians. Okay. So, Luciana, if I may just add to what Victor beautifully said in Lance before, that I believe that so far we have been working on effect. What we have to focus is also on the cause. And what I meant by that, when we do engineering and technology, we do as an effect. But the cause, why we do is to benefit the society. And social science is deeply embedded in the society. So we have been so far focusing on just the effect. And I would say cause and effect must go hand in hand. So the interconnection of both is very essential, not only good, but must to have it. Thank you. Thank you. And then there, there are two people that I will ask, allow, allow them to ask questions. We have Andrea Chamorro. And then after that, we have uh, William George to, to go after her. Andrea, please come. come. You're welcome to uh, ask your question. Great. Um... So my question is, often market incentive conflicts with uh, taking the ethical course of action when it comes to the earth, resources, ecosystems, and vulnerable people. So my question is, how does one convince people who have always grown to prioritize the market incentive to think differently? Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, she's asked, she's make, making the point that uh, typically decisions are made prioritizing the market incentive. And she argues that that's in conflict with the ethical course of action, right? Uh, on the yeah. earth, the environment, the ecosystem. And she's trying to, how we prioritize that. Uh, yeah, I would like to comment on uh, Andrea's uh, uh, co uh, question. Thank you, Andrea. Because that uh, is a question that I have asked myself several times. Uh, <laughs> one first step is, of course, to uh, uh, educate people, as we did mention before, in a new way of thinking. Consciousness, ethical principles. But uh, Andrea could say, okay, that's, that's all right, but uh, at the best, that will take a long time to, to achieve. So I think the only way to do it uh, is to, to produce uh, public policies based on evidence, based on ethical principles, and that will uh, uh, end up as regulations and laws to prevent that, uh, that attitude, uh, which is uh, 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 a terrible thing to the world and to the rest of society. So the short answer to Andrea is we need, uh, starting now, to produce new 
uh, public policies to prevent that. I, I can jump in very quickly, Luciano, too, and, and echo everything that Victor just beautifully articulated. I think it, it does um, you know, very much have a data-driven policy angle. And I think um, the other piece that I think of, Andrea, when I look at your question is, who are the people we're trying to convince? So, you know, it, it may be policy influences, influencers, for example, as, as Victor was saying, it might be corporations, right, as we were talking about earlier. Um, it might be uh, activist organizations or others who, you know, through kind of their volume, right, can, can organize to, to convince, right, or to, to try to influence. So for me, the first question to ask is, which people are we talking about? And then secondly, to drill down into what their interests are. Right. So, you know, for me, I always kind of think of the classic, you know, there's a difference between someone's position on an issue and kind of their underlying issues, right, or interests, rather, excuse me. Sometimes their position is what they articulate out loud, but if you drill down and you listen very carefully to what their actual interests are, um, you, can, you can learn a little bit about how to uh, kind of persuade or, or move the needle on, on behavior. So, so those are the two observations that I have. And then just the third is to say that your question is a wonderful one because it is so difficult to navigate. Thank you, Stacey. And I know um, we need to transition uh, to the next part, but I'll allow Bill George. I think he has a question. Can you ask one quickly? Oh, we, William George. Yes, you have a, you have yes. a question. Yes. Thank you, Luciano, for bringing this wonderful panel. My question, it's not kind of a question, it's kind of like, I need your opinion. When you look at pandemic, it has given us two things. They are good, people have lost life. And then when you look at from the environmental perspective, we have kind of like seen some kind of relief, whereby when you look at the climate change, things have been like kind of okay. So we have seen a reduction in, uh, in carbon dioxide, reduction in, in nitrogen dioxide. All these things are very good for climate change. And when you look at the, the death rate that are being accountable for when it comes to cl climate change is approximately 5 million people every year, premature deaths. If you compare this number to coronavirus, which is now standing around 1.5, close to 2 million, of course, climate change is way, way worse. So I'm like, what should we tell the policymakers from this pandemic to make sure that they try to divert more resources towards fighting climate change? Because when coronavirus came in, you saw everyone was like, okay, here are the funding. Everyone was like, was so eager. But when you compare the dangers of the two, of climate change versus coronavirus, climate change is way worse. Thank you. That's an excellent observation. I mean, that, that's a very thoughtful question. Um, and I think that I don't have a terrific answer for you. I think it's, it's, it's the visibility versus the hidden loss. If you know, you know, so what happened in a, in, with the pandemic is that you saw what was going on. You, we were beating the pans to, to, to celebrate the healthcare workers who were working under a uh, you know, difficult conditions and so forth. It was in front of our eyes. And so we, so we respond. Um, and so with climate change, it's a kind of hidden scourge. You know, we don't see it or we don't, or we can, we can turn a blind eye more easily. And so I think it allows us to kind of, you know, sort of pretend it's not there. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's just a very, you're asking a very deep question and, I wish I could say I had a very deep response to it, but you know, to me, that's the that's the difference. So, George, if I may build upon Lance's point, AJ, can you, you do it use... quickly? Because AJ, can you do it quickly? Sure. We need to transition to the to the distinguished lecture. No, no, go ahead. Uh, this can be uh, George. You can reach me later. So, Lucy and I know time is important. You please go ahead. No, no, no. Just to, if you could do it in thirty seconds, that would be great. That way. You are asking a professor to do it in 30 seconds. That is difficult. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best. Thank you, Luciana. I would say that instead of using the word policymaker, use the word that humans are making a decision. And inherently, humans are more reactive than proactive. So if you take two patients in ER, tuberculosis versus cancer, 
Typically, tuberculosis, you can get a quick help because you can see it. Cancer, you cannot. And that is just the human nature, that how we react to the realities. So it might be a kind of a compass to think about it, but I don't think I have a full answer for that. Thank you. Good question. Uh, so at this point, I really, we want all of us to thank and give a gift clap to the panelists. Thank you so much, Lance. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Victor. And what we, what we like to do is to keep all of you here, please. We're going to transition to the to the distinguished lecture that Victor is going to give. And Maria is going to make a few comments before we start. This is going to start in, 30, in five minutes. Yes, Maria. Thank you so much, Lance. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Victor. <laughs>